It is good to be with you again tonight. If you have any updates to our prayer concerns, I hope you'll let us know. Give me a call at 608-224-0274 or get in touch with the information that'll be on the screen in just a few minutes. Remember, we're still meeting for worship two times every Sunday at 9 o'clock and also at 1030. So sign up online through the Sign Up Genius account. If you do not have an email with the church directory, that's how those are connected. Uh, get in touch with me or with Kenna, and we'd be glad to add you to that list. But if you have anything that we need to be praying about, I hope you'll give me a call or send an email or a text uh, sometime today or in the next several days. Right now, I am at Governor Dodge State Park on Tuesday morning. I got here a little bit before sunrise this morning, did a little bit of hiking, and came up to a place that I had never been before, uh, Any Point, and I'm not sure if that's how it's pronounced. I've never heard it pronounced. I've only seen it, but it's E-N-E-E, -E -E, I believe. And so I'm up here, and I might be a little bit out of breath. It was a, a good little uh, walk up here, but uh, just a beautiful place. And we're going to be talking about a chasm or a canyon between two places. And uh, I'm up here on top of these rocks, and I think that may be an appropriate place for us to have our class tonight. Tonight we're getting back to our study of the book of Luke. By way of review, we know Luke was a medical doctor. We know that he wrote, writes both Luke and Acts to a man by the name of Theophilus. He makes a point of writing in chronological order. He includes a number of groups that are often overlooked or uh, marginalized in the ancient world. Last week we looked at Luke 15 with a series of parables told in response to the scribes and the Pharisees complaining about Jesus eating with sinners. The parables of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And in all three of these, we see an emphasis on rejoicing instead of complaining when what is lost is found. Everybody knows you rejoice when something that's lost is found, but that is the exact opposite of what the scribes and the Pharisees were doing. So tonight we continue with Luke chapter 16 and the harmony of the Gospels. Nothing gets inserted here. So we're just going right through Luke. We're not using the harmony for a few weeks here uh, since Luke includes some information that is found here and nowhere else. But tonight we start with Luke chapter 16 verses 1 through 9. Luke 16, 1 through 9. Now he was also saying to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager. And this manager was reported to him as squandering his possessions. And he called him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give an accounting of your management, for you can no longer be manager. The manager said to himself, What shall I do? Since my master is taking the management away from me, I'm not strong enough to dig. I am ashamed to beg. I know what I shall do. So that when I am removed from the management, people will welcome me into their homes. And he summoned each one of his master's debtors, and he began saying to the first, How much do you owe my master? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. And he said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, And how much do you owe? And he said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. And his master praised the unrighteous manager because he had acted shrewdly, for the sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of light. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by means of the wealth of unrighteousness, so that when it fails, they will receive you into the eternal dwellings. And so we start tonight with a parable or a story about a rich man with a dishonest manager. The manager is squandering or wasting the rich man's possessions. He was hired to manage the man's wealth. But instead of handling it in a good way, this man is making some bad choices. And so he is wasting the rich man's riches. So the rich man calls the manager in, demanding that he give an accounting. It's time to spill it. Not only that, but you're fired, basically. This is it. This is the end of the road for this, uh, this servant. As he leaves, though, on his way out, the manager realizes that he's far too wimpy to dig for a living. I can't dig. I'm not strong enough. I don't have that in me. He's too ashamed to beg. I don't want to be a beggar. And so on his way out, he devises a plan. In the last few moments on the job, he brings in everybody who owes the rich man items or money or whatever it is. These are items in this case. And he whacks what they owe. He cuts it down from 100 measures of oil down to 50, from 100 measures of wheat down to 80, and so on. And he does this so that these people will welcome him into their own homes when he gets kicked out. So he's basically buying himself some friends, is maybe the way we might explain it today. He's using money that's not even his for his own benefit, which is pretty much what he was probably doing before. 
Uh, just a note here, some have suggested that the rich man in this story is perhaps guilty of charging excessive interest, which was illegal under God's law. But the Pharisees got around this by using commodities instead of cash. And so I'm not technically charging interest because it's not a denarius or whatever, but instead these are bushels of wheat or measures of oil and flour and that kind of thing. So there is the speculation here that there's a chance that the, that the rich man was not being honest with his finances either. And so by doing this, by cutting down these debts as he did, the manager really cannot be prosecuted himself without the rich man or the master admitting what's really going on here. And this is an interesting possibility. He really covers himself in a good way. The manager covers himself by holding this over the master's head. You can't get me in trouble or word will get out exactly what you've been doing. When the rich man finds out about all this, notice his reaction. He praises the unrighteous manager because he acted shrewdly. In other words, as I see it, oh, I wish I had thought about that. So here's one dishonest man getting upset with another dishonest man, but it's hard to get upset because he's so impressed with his unique way of being dishonest. So the master, as I understand it, doesn't really approve of what the man has done, but he is so incredibly impressed by it. He just can't believe it. That, that's an awesome move. It's terrible, uh, but it is really clever uh, because uh, the manager is referred to in verse 8 as being unrighteous. So there's nothing really good going on here in terms of uh, being honest with money or anything like that. So this is clearly immoral behavior. This is wrong. Do not do this. However, notice Jesus uses this story to teach a lesson. And the point that he's making is that evil people are often more shrewd, more crafty, more creative in using their wealth than we are, than the sons of light are, than God's people are. And so he's not telling us to be dishonest, but he seems to be telling us to use our wealth to our spiritual advantage. Use money, which is worldly, to make friends for eternity. He's telling us to use our physical resources to build up spiritual wealth for eternity, for the life to come. We are to lay up our treasures in heaven, as Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, on the Mount back in the book of Matthew. Well, the teaching on wealth continues over into the next paragraph. So let's keep on looking then at Luke chapter 16, verses 10 through 13. Luke 16, 10 through 13. He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, who will entrust the true riches to you? And if you have not been faithful in the use of that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. As I see it, this paragraph pretty much summarizes the importance of using our wealth appropriately for a spiritual advantage. He starts with a universal truth. If somebody does well with a little bit, he will also likely do well with much. But on the other hand, if somebody does not do well with a little bit, he will also not do well with much. I remember one college professor making the point on the first day of class as he was explaining the syllabus, if you can write a good 10-page paper, I'm pretty sure you can write a good 30-page paper. And if you cannot write a good 10-page paper, then I also know that you will not be able to write a good 30-page paper. So, therefore, just write me a good 10-page paper. That was his instruction as he explained the syllabus, and that saved him a lot of grading, didn't it? With a class of 30 or 40 people having to grade 10-page papers instead of a bunch of 30-page 30 uh, 30 papers. Uh, he was one of the hardest professors I ever had, by the way. He's also one of the main reasons I went to Fried Hardeman in the first place. He made it possible for me to go there. Uh, that was Brother Dowell Flatt, uh, the one who compiled the chronology of the life of Paul that we use whenever we study the book of Acts or any of Paul's letters. But it's the same principle. How we handle a little bit is also a pretty good indicator of how we'll handle more and more. As parents, we often use this reasoning with our children. As we give them more and more responsibility, we start small and we build from there if they can handle taking out the trash, they can handle something else. But if they can't handle taking out the trash on a weekly basis, 
then we probably can't trust them with the family car either. And so the same principle seems to apply. In verse 11, Jesus applies this to the leap from physical wealth to eternal wealth. How we handle money is something of a test. If we're not good stewards and managers of what is not our own, in verse 12, there is no way that God will trust us with eternal salvation either. How we handle our stuff in this life, our money, our cars, our homes, this is a test. It's a way of proving what is really, truly important to us. In verse 13, Jesus compares the choice between God and wealth as a choice between serving two masters. It is impossible to fully serve or fully please two masters. And in the same way, it is impossible to truly serve both God and wealth. We need to make a choice one or the other. If we were together, I might ask, in what way is wealth a master? In what sense is wealth a master? Personally, I think what he's suggesting here is wealth has a way of controlling us, doesn't it? We seem to always want more. And the more we get, the more we want. And we think we'll be satisfied, but we're not. And it keeps on growing. It gets out of control. Wealth is addictive. Money itself, it will never truly satisfy. It will not fill the God-shaped hole that we have in our hearts. And we'll always be hungry for more and more and more. And that constant longing for more, that is not compatible with serving God. Okay, let's go on and look at Luke 16, the next paragraph. This is verses 14 through 18. Luke 16, verses 14 through 18. Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, were listening to all these things and were scoffing at him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knows your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since that time, the gospel of the kingdom of God has been preached, and everyone is forcing his way into it. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of a letter of the law to fail. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and he who marries one who is divorced from a husband commits adultery. In verse 14, we have an interesting and somewhat expected response from the Pharisees. They're not happy. We find here that the Pharisees are lovers of money. I would have us remember that Paul, once a Pharisee himself, is the one who would go on to write a number of years later that the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 10. And so it seems that perhaps Paul was writing not only by inspiration, but also by experience, having been a Pharisee, having perhaps been at one time a lover of money. As Jesus says that they were, or as Luke points out here, Paul came to understand the danger of it, though, when he obeyed the gospel. But here the Pharisees, the lovers of money, they are scoffing at Jesus. The word we have translated here as scoffing refers to turning up the nose at somebody. They were mocking, they were sneering, they were making obscene gestures toward the Lord. They were making fun of Jesus for saying this. I'm guessing they were, in a sense, defending themselves. You know, certainly what Jesus says here it can't apply to me. This isn't the truth for me. It may be true for you, but not me. And that, that I think, is why Jesus answers the way he does in verse 15. Notice, he knows they are justifying themselves in the sight of men, but God knows their hearts. God can see through it. Other human beings might admire these men for being as wealthy as they are and for showing off what they have, but God is not impressed by that. In fact, this is detestable behavior in the sight of God. In God's eyes, it is disgusting to see people in love with money. He knows how ridiculous it is. Imagine being God and looking down on this earth and seeing some people starving while other people are hoarding. Imagine what impact that has on God's heart. I'm guessing it would be infuriating to him. And this is what God sees in the Pharisees. The next few verses are, are not very obviously tied together, and yet I think they are. But in verse 16, Jesus makes an interesting statement that the law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. It seems then that once John shows up, a new system is starting to be preached. As I understand it, the law of Moses was in effect until the crucifixion. And yet, starting with John a number of years before that, God starts to introduce a new law in a new way. A new covenant is starting to be proclaimed. 
It wasn't written down until a few decades after the crucifixion, but John the Baptist and his ministry, that's what starts the transition. John is preaching the gospel, the good news, and as we know, John's message was a message of repentance. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And since he started preaching, people have been trying to force their way into the kingdom. Being baptized was the popular thing to do back in those days. They were practically tripping over each other to see who could be baptized first. In Mark 1 verse 5, for example, Mark says, And all the country of Judea was going out to him, and all the people of Jerusalem, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. And so being baptized was the thing to do. They were forcing their way into the kingdom, if that's what that figure of speech means. To me, verse 17 is almost completely random, at least on first reading. To me, it doesn't seem to fit uh, right away with either verse before it or the verse after it. There's a pretty good chance, of course, that this is part of a much larger context that we don't have, that Jesus said a whole lot more on this occasion, that Luke only hits the highlights for us, so that's a possibility. But whatever the original, more expanded context might have been, this is what we have. Luke, as an inspired writer, makes sure that we have this. And he emphasizes that it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of a letter of the law to fail. And we've seen this reminder a number of times in Scripture that God's Word is permanent. His Word never changes. And with that, maybe this is the connection to verse 16, that the law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Just because they're no longer proclaimed doesn't mean that they're gone, doesn't mean that they're useless, far from it. The Law and the Prophets have a way of leading us to Jesus and explaining who Jesus is. The Law, though, is no longer binding on us today, but it still has value to us. That's why we study it so often. That's why we're in Proverbs in our Sunday morning studies. We close this paragraph with a reminder about God's law for marriage. And I'm thinking this is almost an example of one of those laws that the Pharisees were completely ignoring. That's a possibility in context. And so he throws this in. Speaking of laws being annulled, uh, how about this one? This is one you people ignore. If anyone divorces his wife and marries another, he commits adultery. And commits is not a one-time act. This isn't just the wedding that's sinful. You don't have to repent of just the wedding. This is more than that. It is the marriage itself. This new union with another woman. This is adultery. Leaving your wife and marrying someone else is in and of itself adultery. And the solution is to stop the adultery, get out of that relationship. And Luke makes sure we know that whoever marries someone who is divorced also commits adultery. This is something many people overlook. And so a completely innocent person, having never been married before, can marry somebody who has been divorced, and he or she commits the sin of adultery in the process. I would also note Luke doesn't give the exception here. This is not a comprehensive teaching on marriage and divorce and remarriage. We have to go to Matthew 19 and 1 Corinthians 7 and some other passages for that. Uh, but Luke here keeps it very simple. With this, let's move on to the last paragraph. It's a bit long to fit on one screen, but it all goes together. It's a paragraph that I think most of us are familiar with, a very familiar account. So let's move on. Let's go to Luke 16, 19 through 31. Luke 16, starting at verse 19 and going on through the end of the chapter. Now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores, and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he is being comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great chasm fixed, so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able, and that none may cross over from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers. 
in order that he may warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, No, Father Abraham. But if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead. The big debate over this passage is whether what Jesus says here is a parable or an account of something that actually happens. I would definitely lean toward the actual account side of this. And the main reason is we have an actual name here, don't we? Lazarus. If this is a parable, which I really do not believe it is, but if it is, this would be the only parable Jesus ever told where an actual proper name is ever given. And that's strange. You don't tell a, a hypothetical story with an actual name. That, that does not make sense. And so it doesn't sound like a parable. If it had been a parable, it seems to me Jesus could have very easily just referred to a rich man and a poor man. But instead, he refers to this man as Lazarus. If we were together, I might ask, why might some people really want to classify this as a parable? You know, why is this a big deal? Well, as we're about to discover, uh, this passage gives us some pretty important information about what happens when this life is over. A lot of people want to think that when we die, we just sleep, or that there is no torment, that we just cease to exist. And yet this parable is not a parable. This is, a, this is an account. And so they'll try to label it as a parable to try to get rid of the unpleasant aspects of what is in this passage. All right, so there are many people who want that uh, information to go away. They want Jesus to be speaking figuratively here, not literally. The problem is, again, we've got the man's name. And so it seems to be not a parable, but rather an account of something that actually happens. By the way, we do have another Lazarus in the Bible, don't we? Lazarus was the brother of Mary and Martha, and Jesus had raised him from the dead over in John 11. I'm not saying it's the same guy. I don't think it is. I'm just pointing out that we might have two Lazaruses in the Bible. I've never said the plural of Lazarus. I don't know. Uh, my Latin background wants to say Lazari, but uh, Lazarus. So we have two Lazaruses in the Bible, two references to Lazarus. There's one way to avoid it. Uh, in the account itself, we have two main characters. We've got the rich man and the poor man, Lazarus. The rich man is really rich. And Jesus goes above and beyond here. He habitually dresses in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. In other words, he's not your average Pharisee, um, but he's a wealthy Pharisee. Or maybe he is like a lot of the Pharisees, wealthy and loving it. But then on the other hand, we have Lazarus, this poor man who is laid at his gate. And so there's some kind of inability to travel or walk going on here, some kind of disability. He's covered with sores, uh, longing to be fed with the crumbs that were falling from the rich man's table. We also learn that the dogs are coming and licking his sores. I don't know if that's the worst part of this or if maybe this is the only comfort he has, the only uh, relief that he has, the companionship of the dogs. And this will get a little bit more important later on. So Lazarus dies. He's carried away by the angels to a place referred to as Abraham's bosom. Elsewhere in the Bible, I think we'll see this place described as paradise, a waiting place for those who are saved. The rich man also dies, but notice he is buried. It's interesting to me that there's no reference to Lazarus being buried. It's because the burial wasn't important. We assume maybe he was buried, but maybe not. Sometimes the bodies of the poor were thrown in the local dump in the valley of Hinnom, a pile of garbage that was always on fire. So Lazarus died, he's carried away by the angels to be with Abraham, but the rich man dies and he's buried. I'm sure it was very respectable, honorable thing said about this man at his lavish funeral or whatever, but when he opens his eyes, he is in torment, he is in flames. Notice the difference, the body of Lazarus is perhaps thrown in the flaming garbage dump where poor people were thrown. But it's the rich man who ends up in actual torment. Hades, by the way, is a word that seems to refer simply to the place of the dead. It's not necessarily bad. Hades is where we all go when we die. It's more of an umbrella category that would include both paradise and the place of torment. It's the place where dead people go, one of two places within that larger place, we might say. Uh, we know that Jesus went to Hades when he died. His soul was not abandoned in Hades, the scripture says, but he was also in paradise. Remember, truly, truly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. And so paradise seems to be uh, kind of a subcategory, if we want to put it that way, of, of Hades. 
So both the place of torment and paradise are places we have a choice of going when we die and are all therefore classified, we might say, as Hades. Uh, let's also notice that the rich man, even in torment, thinks that he can still get his way. He thinks he can boss people around. He calls on Abraham and he wants Abraham to send Lazarus, send him on a mission, go make him do something, go dip his finger in water to cool off my tongue. Notice he still has the attitude, he has the mind of a rich man, doesn't he? Even in torment. And notice also that there is some recognition in the life after this one. The rich man can see Lazarus. He knows that Lazarus is Lazarus. And so in the life after this one, we're not nameless blobs. Some people will ask that some, uh, from time to time. Do we know each other in the life to come? And I believe this teaches, yes, that, that we will. We know who we are, and we also know who other people are. We recognize each other. However, Abraham replies to the rich man's request by telling him to remember. And so we also learn here that we will have memories of this life in the life to come. And Abraham reminds the rich man that he's pretty much already had all of his fun. And now things have been reversed. Lazarus is being comforted, not by dogs as previously, but by angels apparently. He's in comfort and the rich man is now in torment with no servants of his own. Not only that, but there is a huge canyon between the two. Nobody can cross over. The way I see it, the time to cross over is now for those of us uh, participating in this class tonight. Before this life comes to an end is when we can cross the gap between the saved and the lost. Because once this life is over, there is a great chasm, canyon that opens up between the saved and the lost. And it is uncrossable. Years ago, we went to the Grand Canyon as a family. And we started at the North Rim. We took the Bright Angel Trail on a narrow ledge or projection out into the canyon. Absolutely terrifying for some people in our family. And we looked around for a little bit into this huge hole in the ground. If you've been there, you understand something of, of what I'm explaining here. And so we started there at the, at the North Rim and we looked at it and then we got back in the car and we drove. And we drove and we drove and we drove and we drove some more. And after a number of hours, most of that day, we finally made it to the South Rim of the Grand Canyon. And we could look across and we could see where we had been but it was uncrossable as far as we were concerned at that point. And so as we stood there together as a family on the south rim of the Grand Canyon, we read this passage together. And we decided as a family that we will do everything in our power to not be separated like that when this life is over. In the next life, we do not want to have this huge canyon between us because once this life is over, that's it. There is no crossing over from one side to the other. In verse 27, the rich man now begs Abraham to send Lazarus to warn his brothers. So here it is again. Tell him to do this. Get me water. Go send him on this mission so that they don't come to this place of torment. Uh, I know sometimes people worry about loved ones who've died without obeying the gospel. First of all, as with all of those cases, God is the judge. We're not. But what we learn from this passage is even the rich man in torment, wanted to do everything possible to warn his family, do not come here. Even though it would mean separation across that chasm, the rich man wanted Abraham to send Lazarus to warn them. Notice that he's still thinking of Lazarus as somebody he can send on an errand. But even though it would mean being alone and separated from his family, he did not want them to come there. However, Abraham reminds the rich man that his brothers have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Doesn't that tie in to that passage earlier that we read about not one thing being annulled or wiped away from the law? To which the rich man objects by arguing that they'll only listen if somebody comes back from the dead. Only then will they repent. But Abraham once again says that if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, that not even somebody coming back from the dead will persuade them. And this is amazing, isn't it? Because Jesus knows what is about to happen in just a few months. He will be coming back from the dead. And there will be many of this rich man's brothers who will not accept the gospel, even when a man comes back from the dead. Also note, an actual guy named Lazarus actually did come back from the dead. 
And these people still didn't believe in Jesus. That brings us to the end of this chapter. I know there is so much more that we can say, but uh, we were just kind of doing, I guess, the overview here, but we've made it through Luke chapter 16. Uh, thank you so much for being with us tonight, either online or on the phone. Be sure to send me any prayer requests, anything that we need to be praying about, any updates, so I can get those in the bulletin. Um, I've talked to a few people this week who've made the comment that, uh, that they're feeling disconnected. They don't get the updates. And so if you have anything new or different or anybody's getting better who's in the prayer list or getting worse or anything like that, please share that with me so that we can turn around and get that back out there to the rest of the congregation. Uh, next week, let's come prepared for the next study by looking together at Luke chapter 17. Uh, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we praise you tonight for being the one and only awesome God, a loving Father who has given us the amazing blessing of knowing you through your word. This is an awesome, just tremendous responsibility, and we ask tonight that we would be faithful stewards of what has been entrusted to us, that we would use our wealth in this life in a way that would introduce others to you. Thank you for blessing us with abundant resources. We pray that as your people, we would manage these blessings in a way that honors you, we ask for your help as we do good and share because we know that with these sacrifices, you are pleased. Thank you for opening the door just a little bit into the life that's coming after this one. Thank you for both the warning and the promise here in the book of Luke. Thank you for your word, not only for the law and for the prophets, but we thank you especially for the good news as it is revealed to us by Luke, the beloved physician. Bless us as we teach and as we love on our families. We pray that we would live in such a way that we will be together with you for eternity in the life to come. We come to you with these requests, both thanking and praising you. In the name of Jesus, your Son, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.